Let's just run through a few um, areas around you know, why it's important, what it does, and answer some of those basic FAQs that people have around, around air conditioning. So why is it important? We have commercial buildings to provide homes for people's businesses. Um, we're doing this in a competitive industry. In some ways, as owners and managers and maintainers, we're selling comfortable, productive, safe, sustainable work environments. That's our business. Uh, and HVAC is very central to that. In the first issue, in the first instance, it's very much about amenity. It's very much about tenant services. So it's about comfort. It's about reliability. It's about health. It's about safety. It's also about compliance. Um, the built environment, some would argue, is the most heavily regulated industry in the country. Um, and those of you that work in the property management and facilities management areas would, I think, no doubt agree with me. So essential services maintenance, building regulations, safety, there's a whole range of things which we'll touch upon. It costs serious money to install HVAC. It costs, it costs serious money to, to keep the energy up to it and it, it costs to maintain the thing properly. It's an asset that needs to be managed and maintained and looked after. And in, as such, as an asset, it really is. It really is installed capital and you do need to look at it that way as such. A recent report from the City of Melbourne um, put in place after the last little hot spell we had um, after Christmas indicated that, um, and that, that was you know, talking to about 600 people, um, to gauge their perceived uh, perceptions of the impact of the heat wave. The survey discovered that uh, the majority of businesses perceived negative in impacts in terms of operational costs of air conditioning, the level of comfort of their workforce, and the motivation and morale of their workforce. So I suppose just reinforcing some of the things Michelle be said before, which I'm sure you understand implicitly. HVAC systems, um, in a base building sense, are responsible for something between 50% and 70% usually of, of the energy consumption in buildings. But more importantly, when you look to improve the energy efficiency in the building, um, the majority of the opportunity is in the HVAC system. And then when you look at it on the other side of the coin and look at the risk around actually losing your energy efficiency, that's where the real issues are around HVAC. Lighting systems largely set and forget. HVAC systems, if you take your eye off them, anything you've invested in by way of improvement may very well disappear. Another issue which is, which is coming up more and more and becoming more of an issue around the country is HVAC systems on a hot February afternoon are significant drivers of maximum demand through electricity networks. So consequently they're becoming more and more um, in focus around that side of things. And I mentioned before dollars, um, the management, the maintenance, ownership issues, repair issues and what have you, compliance issues associated with air conditioning, typically around up to 25% of the outgoings in the commercial building. So it's not an insignificant number in terms of dollars, not an insignificant topic to focus on. So really, what does HVAC does? Uh, sorry, HVAC do. So yeah, it, it, it provides all these wonderful things by way of a mini, but what does it really do? In the first instance, it provides ventilation. In the space we've got, we're in today, there's no openable windows. For health, for safety, for comfort, we rely upon the air conditioning system ventilating the space, providing outside air, providing clean air. As an interesting aside to that, these systems also have an important role to play in fire mode. So when the building goes into fire mode, you've got a fire in the building, smoke's being generated. The ventilation systems need to be designed to actually remove the smoke and make a safe path of egress for people. So people get out safely because the systems are taking the smoke away. Also, systems need to actually be designed and be maintained to ensure that they operate, that they don't actually encourage the fire. So there's a whole range of implications around HVAC systems from a fire perspective, which we'll talk a bit more about later on. Obviously, heating and cooling, um, and very much also the quality of the air. It's no good drawing air straight in off Swanson Street um, without some sort of filtration. So we're ventilating the building. We're running air through the building, um, taking away contaminants, taking the heat out of the building, if you like. Heating, please. There's a series of heat loads around the building. So you've got heat generated by people, heat generated by business, plant and equipment, the sun streaming in through the windows, you've got a hot day outside, you've got to get the heat out of the system. And the air conditioning system does that. And filtration, please. I also mentioned filtration. Um, clearly whatever air comes in and goes out needs to be needs to be looked after in that sense. 
So let's talk about how this technical system provides, in the first instance, ventilation and clean air, how it moves energy around, how it might move smoke out of, in and out of the building. Um, let's talk about heat loads. Let's talk about the, the, the use of air to do all of this. So effectively what you have is you have a room generating heat, needs ventilating, needs clean air, and the HVAC system is the system that does that. It uses air as a medium uh, in terms of moving air in, moving air out. Perhaps just to dip into a little bit more technical than what I will later in the presentation. When you think about that in, say, a domestic sense, you're bringing, let's say, cool air into the room. The room's requirements will change. People will come in, people will go out. The, the sun will move around, so the heat load in the room will change. You need to be able to modulate what you're doing in the room. And there's two ways that that happens, basically. You either vary the amount of air that's coming into the room at the same temperature, or you change the temperature of the air that's coming into the room. And this will become a little bit important a little bit later on. So we start to introduce terms like variable air volume and constant volume. I'm sure a number of you in the room would have heard the term VAV and VAV boxes. Pretty important thing when it comes to maintenance. But anyway, let's just, let's just dip up a little bit from, from that. So let's get a little bit more technical and talk about systems as such. How does all this work? You effectively have something which is fairly imaginatively called an air handling unit. And so outside air is drawn into the air handling unit by the fan through a bank of filters. It's blown through a set of coils, which are not unlike the radiator in a car. The air is either heated or it's cooled, and the air is blown into the room. The air picks up the particulates and the contaminants. It picks up the heat. It goes out of the room, and it's, it's largely recycled. By and large, air conditioning, cycle, uh, air conditioning systems, the majority of air in air conditioning systems is recycled. But it's mixed with outside air, so that you always have a certain percentage of fresh air in the process. So recognise that that's, that's a, you know, a very much, a, let's call it a room. So how does all this, all this happen? How does the coil get hot or cold? From a heating perspective, you've got a coil which has got hot water running through it. That hot water is heated by a boiler. You've got a closed circuit piping system, and that boiler, of course, is powered by gas these days. So what you have is the, the coil has got hot water running through it, the air is flowing through the coil, and it's warming up accordingly. On the cooling side of things, you have a thing the industry calls a chiller. A chiller is effectively a large refrigeration machine which, which produces cold water at around four degrees Celsius, and that water is circulated up into the coils. It takes up the heat from the air that's flowing through it and goes back into the chiller as such. And that's how the, the air is either heated or cooled in this box, which is called an air handling unit. Now, the fan's driving the air through. The fan's driven by electric motor. Chill is a little bit like a refrigerator in some ways. If you go around to the back of your refrigerator, you'll find a coil on the back of that which is quite warm. Why is that quite warm? It's taking energy or, or heat out of the internal of the refrigerator and it's actually pushing it out into the atmosphere with the coil on the back. So what I'm saying is the chiller, once it takes the water, the heat out of the water, it needs to put that heat somewhere. And typically in a building, that heat is exported to a cooling tower and we use evaporation to cool that water down. And then that water is cycled back to the, to the chiller as such as, as, a cooler, as, a, as a cooler temperature. So that's why you've got cooling towers in the building. They're effectively exporting the heat or the energy to the atmosphere using the, the evaporation, if you like. It's no different to putting a, a wet, sweaty arm out of the window when you're driving along in your car. Your arm feels cool. That's what evaporation does. It takes the heat away as such. So in all of this, you've got motors driving fans, motors driving pumps, motors driving machines uh, around chillers, you've got motors driving fans. That's where the energy is being consumed. Of course, you've also, in these things here, got air being mixed. So hot air and cold air is being mixed to get just the temperature you want. That's another, another aspect, of course, that's just one room. If you think about a high-rise office tower um, and think about a floor plan and think about the heat loads. So the heat loads internally will change as people come and go during the day, but also as the sun moves around the building. So you've effectively got five zones um, in, a, in a square floor plan. You've got an internal zone where really there's not a great deal of effect from the sun. You've got a north zone, east zone, west zone, south zone. And these vary throughout the day. So you effectively have, in some sense, five rooms per floor in, as a minimal sense. Think about that in a 50-storey building. That's 250 rooms. 
That's a degree of complexity, I suppose, even before you start thinking about enclosed offices or you start thinking about meeting rooms that need more outside air than, say, a, a one-person office because you've got 15 people in the room. So all of a sudden, whilst the basic principles aren't, concept, uh, aren't, aren't complex, once you start to multiply that out in terms of the spaces in a building and the differing requirements throughout the day, the thing becomes quite complex in terms of scale. So all this needs controlling, as you'd imagine. And what, what we find in buildings is we have things called building management systems, building automation systems, building management and control systems. They're effectively the brains and the nervous system of the building. And so you've got a myriad of sensors, a myriad of feedback loops, a lot of wiring, and obviously a computer head in which is controlling all these things as to when things work, how they work, and importantly, how they work together. So it's not enough to simply control a boiler or control a chiller. You've actually got to control all those things. So they actually work in concert. And that's really where we get to when we start talking about tuning. Control systems don't use energy. These things use energy. And control systems are effectively the methodology you use to tune those systems so that they actually work properly together. So there's no wasted effort as such. So what do these things look like? The imaginatively named air handling unit looks pretty much like you'd expect, just a great big insulated box with doors on it. Cooling towers, I'm sure you've seen them on top of buildings and outside car parks and things like that, um, are pretty much, again, a box. You've got air flow, you've got water flowing down through the box, air flowing up through the box. And when the water meets the air on a surface, you've effectively got an evaporative effect which cools the water. Chillers we talked about, large refrigeration plant, refrigeration compressors, controls, heat exchanges and what have you. In some ways, um, pretty much the same device that sits in the bottom of your fridge on a larger scale. And boilers, again, burner, uh, large heat exchange area, a vessel full of water effectively which is being exposed to the, to the heat. These are the sorts of things you see in basements and plant rooms. So let's go forward and perhaps answer a few, um, a few questions that people often ask. How does HVAC use energy and water? I mentioned before that when you break it right down, um, you've got fans, you've got pumps, You've got um, compressors, all driven by electric motors. We understand how that uses energy. It's pretty straight, pretty straightforward. Um, gas into the boilers. Um, it's interesting, it's been said about HVAC systems that when you understand the basics, they certainly aren't rocket science. But when you start to think about how they use energy, or more importantly, how they waste energy, it all of a sudden becomes pretty complex. And that's part of the challenge around improving energy efficiency in HVAC systems. In some ways, we often get the easy things done. The hard things are actually getting right back into trying to tune these things so they work properly. From a water perspective, water is used in cooling towers obviously through evaporation, but there's a lot of water used in cooling towers um, in terms of drainage, in terms of keeping concentration of solids and things like that down and keeping the thing clean. Interestingly, the water consumption in the cooling tower is very much proportional to how much energy you're trying to um, push out of the building. So in some ways it's actually affected by energy efficient energy efficiency. The more energy efficient the building is, the less energy you need to push out of the building because the less it uses, so therefore the less water you, you will use, which is why when you improve the energy efficiency in a building, you also improve your water consumption as well. The two actually are very hardwired in that sense. So how do HVAC systems vary? Um, obviously they don't all look like this. This is very much a generalisation. There are 101 different variations on, on the whole process. Um, one of the important variations, I suppose, that we've seen in the last five or ten years is chilled services, chilled beams. Some of you might be familiar with the term chilled beams. Um, Council House 2, which was mentioned before, has chilled beams. These are effectively cooling or heating surfaces in a space like that, this that actually radiate heat or, or cooling, but they are cooled by chilled water, they are heated by heating hot water, so the componentry is the same. You have chillers, you have boilers, you have those sorts of things as well. Um, you still have air handling units, you still have an air distribution system, you still have all those things I mentioned before. Another option is a refrigerated system. So you take the concept of a refrigerator and write it large, if you like. And so you effectively have a, almost like a split system you have at home with no water. Um, again, um, these probably aren't that common these days. How they vary in different buildings in terms of age and, and quality. Obviously, age and quality are a big thing. I mentioned before about amenity. 
um, is a bit of a standard thing too. So if you've got a premium grade building, you'll have a premium grade air conditioning system capable of ma maintaining conditions and reliability and, and, and what have you. You've got a, a cheaper type of building, something that perhaps is not quite at the same standard. You'll have, again, a system which is not quite at the same standard. Why is maintenance important? Um, things wear out. You, could, you, can, you can see there's lots and lots of things in a HVAC system, lots and lots of things going around, lots and lots of things that are uh, dependent upon being properly adjusted. Um, so things wear out. Things go out of a, a adjustment. Uh, electronic devices drift. Um, seasons change. Uh, things break. Things fail. The use in building changes. Um, buildings are very dynamic places in terms of their, their, their needs. On the other side, air conditioning systems are very resilient systems, the way they're designed. Um, you can have a lot of things go wrong with an air conditioning system which might significantly compromise their, their age. Um, things might wear out much quicker. You might use a lot more energy. You can have a lot of things go wrong and you'll never notice because they'll still maintain conditions. It'll still be 21 degrees inside, but you're using twice as much energy, you'll never know. Or you're wearing out your chiller at twice the rate you should be, but you'll never know just by simply the fact that things still doing its job. Very, very resilient. Um, there might not be enough outside air coming in. It's a long time before people will start talking about it being a bit stuffy. So, but you're outside of regulations. So, um, some very interesting aspects around air conditioning. They're very resilient systems. How do I get to know my HVAC system? Uh, Michelle suggested you go down stairs and patch a chiller. I, I'd, I'd make a better suggestion. Get to know your maintenance contractor. You'll find technical people are only too happy to explain things to you. Get to know your maintenance contractor. Um, with some of the insights um, that we're talking about today and perhaps a little bit more, uh, more research, have an understanding of these things and go and talk to your maintenance contractor. There's no such thing as a dumb question, only dumb answers. Um, and seek to understand. It's not complex at all. There are a lot of references out there. ERA has an online course called Air Conditioning 101, which is very much this multiplied out. Um, a lot more insight, a lot more exercises to do, even history of HVAC and what have you. Um, my organisation, we put all the non-technical people through the course. There's no good working through a, a building services air conditioning specialist company if you don't know what we do. And uh, it's, it's a very useful thing. So go to the ERA website and have a look at that. There are also a range of documents that are available there. Some are very, very technical. Um, if you wanted to go to the next level in terms of understanding, that's not a bad one, which is in introduction to HVAC and R. You probably, as a non-technical person, won't understand uh, half of it, nor do you need to, but clearly with some basic understanding, it'll be a useful thing to do. So there's lots of references out there that you can go and have a look at. Carolyn's just sitting down there, waving her arm. So if you wanted to talk to her afterwards about what area can do around all that, that would be great too. So we've talked about how it works. Hopefully um, I've managed to give some understanding around the basics of the thing without being too technical. The second part of today is around regulatory issues. So what are the regulatory issues around HVAC? Uh, I mentioned before the built environment is one of the more regulated industries that, that in, in the country. Most of the regulations uh, are very much around health and safety and environment, uh, environment being relatively late coming to that field. Uh, so let's have a quick look at each of these. Essential safety measures, building regulations in general safety, a thing called CBD Neighbours, uh, and the refrigerant phase-out program. So at the pointy end, we've got law. Um, and with a lot of the regulations, the responsibility ultimately sits with the owner, even though we may, um, by, way of, by way of history or by way of contract, seek to delegate that down to property managers, facilities managers, or even maintainers. Ultimately, in law, a lot of the legislation sits with the owners as such. Central safety measures legislation, it's called different things in different states, is effectively ensuring that the, that the HVAC will work when it's required to, principally in fire mode. And so if you've got a, a ventilation system which is part of your air conditioning system and it needs to work when the building's in fire mode to extract smoke from the space so that people can get out safely, you need to be able to maintain the system uh, and demonstrate that you've maintained the system such that it will be operable in fire mode. And so there's a whole lot of um, legislation around all of that. It's all about attendance, it's all about um, evidence of that, and obviously there's an annual sign-off that many of you will be familiar with as well. The other aspect is cooling towers. Uh, since the year 2000, certainly in Victoria, Victoria was alluded because of the issues at the aquarium. Uh, we've got a lot of legislation around the requirement to maintain 
uh, to manage and to report on all of that with cooling towers. And that's all driven by a public health risk. Building regulations are effective with the requirements around design and construction and to some extent maintenance in buildings. It sets up standards of construction. So if you're doing retrofits, if you're doing replacements, you'll find that the devices that you buy, whether they be cooling towers or fan cool units or what have you, will have some impact from building regulations. They talk about minimum fresh air and ventilation standards. Um, they talk about minimum levels of maintenance. Obviously, when you get to systems like electrical systems, plumbing systems, you've got the requirement to use licensed contractors and for these things to be done to a certain standard. Um, there is a whole regime around all of that and using licensed providers obviously um, means that there's a cost impost on the industry accordingly. Refrigerants are looked upon as a controlled substance. They're ozone depleting. They also uh, have a global warming potential and so they're a controlled substance. So our organisation has a, a licence to, to buy and install and manage refrigerants and we need to be we audit it every year and what have you. So there's a real, um, there's a real legislative framework around refrigerants as such. Safety is a, a challenge for all of us these days, um, certainly in buildings. Um, again, that responsibility to occupants, including visitors, also including contractors. Um, also in terms of um, maintenance providers, we're all employers. So whether you're a property manager or a, a maintenance contractor, you need to provide a safe workplace for all your employees. So there's a whole lot of emphasis around um, a duty of care to a safe environment. You've got a range of regulations around all that. Um, there's all sorts of challenges when you come to change buildings. Anybody that's been in some of the major city buildings undergoing a retrofit whilst the thing's still partly occupied, you can see some, some of the challenges around safety with all of that. As the industry becomes more aware of safety, and different organisations get their own safety systems up. We're seeing a fair bit of, uh, I suppose, meshing of processes and procedures in the built environment at the moment. Everybody's keen to have their own systems applied and that's obviously adding an overall cost. At the end of the day, you also have a joint and several responsibility around safety, which we often forget. So as individuals, you have a responsibility, a fundamental responsibility for our own safety. Obviously, systems and procedures and what have you need to be in place. But quite often, with the focus on safety, we we forget that individuals have a responsibility as well. But a big thing in buildings and increasingly so. I mentioned before the Commercial Building Disclosure Program and Neighbours. A couple of years ago, the Commonwealth put legislation in place that made it mandatory that if you were to uh, lease or sell commercial space above 2,000 square metres, in that sale or lease process, you needed to disclose its energy efficiency by way of its Neighbours rating. So in some ways, more or less a mandated neighbours rating. Now obviously there are a whole range of overheads associated with getting a neighbours rating and what you do with all that once you get it. And obviously once you get it, you want to keep it. So that adds a little bit of focus back onto maintenance and HVAC and what have you as well. But another regulatory overhead that comes around buildings, which is relatively new. I also talked about refrigerant phase out, um, which has been a little bit of a, the, sleeping, the sleeping giant in the background. Um, some legislation has a very long tail. Uh, the Montreal Protocol was put in place in 1996 and talked about the phase out of ozone depleting gases and so those of you that have been in buildings long enough will remember the phasing out of chillers that ran on R11 and R12. We've now got to the point where in 2016 there will be no importation of R22 and R22 is a refrigerant gas which is used in um, just about everything other than big chillers up until relatively recently. So it's everywhere. Older split units, small part load chillers, um, small DX systems all have R22 in them. So 2016 is an interesting date, but it's not the important phenomenon. The important phenomenon is that manufacturers stopped making devices for R22 some time ago. So parts are getting scarce. And because you can't import R22 or manufacture R22, R22 is getting scarce. So what you're really looking at now is a economic phase out as such. Six years ago, R22, a kilo of R22, and bear in mind a small chiller might have 100 kilos of R22 in it. Six years ago, a kilo of R22 was worth about $20. Today, the retail rate's about $330 a kilo, and it's only going one way, if you can get it. In a few years' time, you'll struggle with availability, and you'll be paying well over $1,000 a kilo for this stuff. So you lose a kilo this, this month, and your monthly service costs you $500. A kilo of refrigerant costs you 1000 so 
it's causing people to look at their old plant. You know, the good news is a lot of this kit's sort of 10, 15 years old, so it's coming to the end of its life cycle. But refrigerants are um, a real issue, and, and R22 is, um, is everywhere. So I come back to the third part of the presentation, which is, I suppose, what I've called ownership issues. Um, so we've looked at how HVAC works, why it's important. We've looked at some of the regulatory issues. Let's talk a little bit about some of the ownership or, um, or the management issues in, in no particular order. As Michelle mentioned, next week we'll try and stitch all this together into a process that looks at how you actually take this knowledge and improve management for better outcomes from a HVAC perspective. And that deals with obviously the technical, but it also deals with a lot of these ownership issues as well because HVAC systems clearly sit in a commercial framework. So system performance, we talked before about how important system performance is. Um, it's all great to say. In some buildings, it's super important. If you're at 101 Collins Street and the temperature's not quite right, you'll have 15 lawyers on the phone before half past seven in the morning or at half past 11 at night. In a lot of mid-tier buildings, you might never ever know because the tenants come and go and really don't care. So somewhere in between, you've got a situation where HVAC performance is important to you. And as facilities managers, property managers or owners, you'll have an idea about how important your HVAC is. Um, obviously it relates, relates back to the whole cycle. You know, complaints, what you get from a rent perspective, where you end up in a vacancy perspective if you like. It also relates back to lease conditions. Increasingly, buildings have clear expectations set out in contract around HVAC performance. The thing needs to do the job that's intended to do. It needs to provide comfortable, productive, safe and sustainable environments, because as I pointed out at the start, that's what we're in the business of selling. Really interesting question, just off to the side. System performance, HVAC system performance, how do you measure that? It's pretty tough to do, isn't it? From a regulatory performance perspective, we've talked about some of those regulatory requirements. This is really, in a built environment sense, some of many, many parts. Lots of people are, are, are attending for compliance. Lots of people are reporting. Um, it's a real increasing cost in buildings. So how you better engage the supply chain and your maintenance providers and your property managers to ensure that the overall burden, if you like, around compliance is the, the least, if you like, is pretty important. You know, the, the truism of the supply chain is that um, supplies, get, uh, supplies push their costs up. So if, if the law changes and all of a sudden um, WorkSafe uh, pretty much dictate that that job's a two-person job, somebody has to hold the ladder these days, the labour costs associated with that's going to double, and so therefore that gets passed on to the property manager, which gets passed on to the owner. So, if you put extra burdens in the building around inductions, around reporting, um, doubling up on things, again, you're adding the cost to the actual building itself and somebody has to pay and ultimately that gets passed up. So it's in everybody's best interest to understand what the requirements are and work out who's doing what in the most elegant way uh, possible. I mentioned before fire testing. One of the, the most vexed areas around air conditioning is very much around making sure it will work in a fire mode sense. And air conditioning systems and their operation in fire mode can be very, very complex. And quite, quite often in buildings, this is not tested properly. Um, and increasingly the regulators are looking at this. And, and again, a, a little bit of a, a thing coming at us all in, in, in some ways. Talked before about the importance of maintenance. I think there's some self-evidence around that, but how much is right? Um, our industry is by and large driven by attendance. Um, it's not driven by performance outcomes. We're not like industry where the level of maintenance is provided um, directly, uh, directly proportional to how the age of the equipment and how important the equipment is. We pretty much do the same thing every month from a compliance perspective. Um, it's relatively simplistic. In some ways, I can use a car analogy, which I'll come back to a little bit later on. It'd be like taking a car to the dealer and the dealer changes the oil and checks the belts, but doesn't make sure the thing's tuned properly. That's effectively the sort of maintenance we do in, in, in buildings around HVAC, typically. And we can get away from that, away with that, because of what I said before. 
HVAC systems are pretty much um, very resilient. They'll, they'll work, um, uh, not work well, but they'll keep working for some time. I mentioned just at the bottom there around change, and we'll talk a lot more about change next week. But managing change in buildings around HVAC systems can be quite challenging. Um, you know, at one end, um, a component fails. So is, do you just do a like-for-like -like replacement? That's typically what we do. That's what we're set up to do. But is that the best thing? That was installed 15 years ago. The building's use has changed. The new kit's 20% more energy efficient if you do certain things. You know, how do you make the decision? But the thing's failed. We have to have it fixed by Monday. You've got to plan for those sorts of things. And clearly, as an industry, we don't do a lot of that. At the other end of the scale, if you're looking at doing a significant upgrade or a retrofit for a HVAC system, it can be quite a complex process because you've got a lot of stakeholders involved, especially in an occupied building. How do you make sure the thing keeps working while you change it floor at a time? So some quite challenging issues around change that we'll talk about a bit more next week. Obviously, environmental impact is an underlying focus of the 1200 Buildings Program and today, um, and more next week on that as well. But a couple of, I suppose, key issues. Um, Measuring and metering. I'm sure pretty much everybody in the room has been along to energy efficiency presentations ad nauseum over the last couple of years. And the first thing any expert up on the stage says, you've got to get your measuring and your metering and your reporting right. You've got to be able to measure it before you can manage it. Um, I'm not going to say anything different because that is absolutely the essence of the thing. The more you know about how your building consumes energy, the, the more you will do about it and the more you will make sure what you do about it works. Um, there's really no substitute for that. Supply contracts are an interesting thing. Um, back in the mid-90s when in this state the SEC V was, was, uh, was broken up and, and sold off, uh, we got all very excited about supply contracts and linking the nature of the supply contract to how we use the energy. We seem to have forgotten a lot of that. Um, but clearly going forward there's some key changes happening in the electricity supply and the gas industry. We'll see a lot more time of use tariffs um, and a lot more requirement or opportunity to actually either, either um, adjust your load or shift your load. So when I say term of, time of use tariff, the, the kilowatt you buy at 2 o'clock on a February afternoon will cost you a lot more than the kilowatt that you'll buy at 2 o'clock in the morning on the same day. So again, trying to level out the demand that HVAC systems put upon electricity um, system as such. So the ability to move load. Um, will be will be important going forward. Um, for the technical people in the room, a return to things like ice storage and chill water storage, the ability to put a battery in a building in a, in a thermal sense. The other issue that is quite often a drama around energy efficiency and energy and water consumption in buildings is knowing what's possible. And the great challenge in all that when you get right to the bottom of is veracity. I've got a consultant and they've told me the, that we can do this in the building and it's going to cost that and save me this. I've got a contractor who thinks we can do that. Veracity, how do you actually prove um, the truthfulness of what they're saying and the surety of outcome? We've got things like energy performance contracts and a whole range of things which attempt to deal with that. But at the end of the day, there is no substitute for the person who's making the decision to have adequate understanding to come back and test the veracity of themselves. When you go and buy a car and the dealer makes a whole range of claims about that car, you effectively yourself get to a point where you can test that veracity. You don't go and get a consultant to, to give you some advice. So again, it's, it's about better understanding um, around those things. We talked before about costs. Um, this is out of the Property Council of Australia's benchmarks for office buildings. Um, if you take the proportion of electricity, which is HVAC, the proportion of building supervision, which is HVAC, um, gas and oil, which is a, a, a bit of a, uh, an old term, um, and building automation, a number of other things, you end up with somewhere between 15 and 25 per cent or even greater in terms of outgoings around HVAC. So some real costs associated with that. Um, Whatever the number is, doesn't matter. It's, it's increasing as a percentage and also as a real number. So costs are up there. It's worth looking at from a commercial perspective. To give you an idea of perhaps um, just some of the orders of magnitude of some of these costs, you know, and in, in the property industry, we often focus on the short-term things. One of the really interesting transitions over the last couple of years has been the, perhaps the last 10 years, has been the real dominance in the market of the big institutional owners. So you've got the, the, the GPTs and the Dexuses and people like that. They now take a long-term actuarial view of property, which we didn't have um, 15, 20 years ago. 
So they see things in a, in a, in a life cycle sense. Uh, but quite often on the ground, we do things in a year by year budgeting sense. And so it's hard to accommodate the fact that your chiller's worth two hundred or $300,000 and you're simply walking past it every month and not looking after this bit of kit that's worth so much money and to some extent it's relatively fragile properly. So there's some expensive bits of kit back in HVAC systems that really need to be looked after properly when you recognise the risks around them and obviously the capital replacement value. So a new HVAC system, um, and we talk about retrofits, nobody actually by and large completely replaces a HVAC system. That doesn't often happen. It does sometimes, but certainly in a new building, um, cost per square metre is around $450 to $750 a square metre. And again, the $750 relates to something like a, a 171 Collins and a $450 relates to something perhaps a, a little bit at the other end of the scale from that. Interesting, you look at those chiller costs there. Um, a large chiller could have $200,000 worth of refrigerant in it. You have a critical failure and you lose your refrigerant charge. Not, not only have you technically broken the law, you've effectively sent $200,000 out the window. Um, some pretty big risks around some of these sorts of things. When you come to look at plant-like chillers, um, there are a whole series of regimes around it, uh, which are obviously monthly, but annual, annual inspections. Um, also things like tuning, tuning systems. Again, it's not just about the maintenance, it's also about the duty they are put under. In a building that's not working well, and if you think back to the, I suppose, the, 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 the makeup I had before around the different components in the building, if you've got those 300 different rooms or zones in a building all calling for cooling at different times and the system not being very well organised and modulated, that chiller might start 500 times a day. The thing might have a 20 kilowatt motor on it. If you tune that particular building, the chiller might start twice a day. The net effect of doing that is that on a, a $200 or $300,000 piece of plant, you might put an extra five or even 10 years on its life. So again, a bigger number than what the energy would be that you would be saving, simply because you're actually not wearing your plant out because it's actually working properly. Again, something people don't talk about when they talk about tuning buildings, they talk about energy efficiency. But you actually, you know, you think about the, Again, car analogy, you're driving down the road, you use your starter motor once a day when you start the car. If you're driving down the road and the starter motor is going off all the time, it'll wear out in a week. Same, same analogy. Things like refrigerant um, containment, refrigerant alarms are things that people are putting in to protect those, those big bits of kit and the risks around those big bits of kit in terms of refrigerant. Another observation around um, looking at replacing plant because you know, everything has a technical and a commercial life cycle. Um, and quite often when you're getting to the end of both, it's hard to pick when to actually make a, make a move. These days, new plant um, can come with five-year extended warranties. Um, from what you can see there with some of the numbers, it's clearly cheaper to maintain new plant because it's not as intensive, thing doesn't break down as much. Uh, you haven't got to have the sort of repair budget you're talking about there. It's also interesting in those numbers up there to have a look at how much the essential services maintenance, if you like, just the compliant bit costs, compared with perhaps what you might do to properly maintain the building, which is one of the reasons why the more informed of you in the room, when you look at those, some of those rates, you'll say, well, geez, I'm not paying that much for my maintenance. And that's pretty much probably because you're simply paying for a drive-by and a sign-off to say that I've actually attended to get compliance, but you're actually not looking after the kit. That's fine if you understand that, Nothing wrong with that at all, but understand it. Understand what you're getting for your money in a maintenance sense. Energy costs are an interesting thing. Um, a little bit of a, a work up there in terms of typical electricity, gas and water costs per square metre in different uh, buildings by way of energy efficiency. So probably once you talk about A's and B's, there's not a lot of 1.5 neighbour star buildings around, but there are a few. Um, but the difference between a 1.5 neighbour star building and a 4.5 star neighbour's building for about a 5,000 square metres building is around $70,000 a year. So if you do the maths on that, that's, that, that, that tells you if, you, say, if you're working on, say, a seven-year payback, and people, some people work on that, some people work on shorter, but you, you work that back and it tells you you've got about $100 a square metre to spend to get a return on energy savings. So there's some basic, I suppose, maths, maths around all that. A couple of points around energy efficiency, again, which we'll, we'll touch upon next week. Energy efficiency always comes with benefits. 
You just don't improve energy efficiency and see your energy bill shrink. You always end up with benefits. You end up with a system which is more reliable. You end up with tenants who are happier. You end up with a system which will last longer. Um, these things always come out of works to make HVAC systems more energy efficiency. The best way to do energy efficiency is not to do energy efficiency in its own right. The best way to do it is actually to work out, well, I'm doing a half-life refit, I'm replacing this bit of kit, or the chiller's worn out. As part of that process, I will make sure I get an energy efficiency outcome as well. So effectively, when you're doing a cost benefit, the benefits are around not just energy, but a whole range of other things as well. You decrease maintenance costs, increase plant life, building positioning, a whole range of different things. Anyway, more about that next year, next year, next week. Just in terms of where energy is all going, it's all a bit interesting at the moment. If I'd stood up here um, two years ago, I'd be saying things around, well, electricity is going to keep going through the roof, we're all going to die. Um, really interesting phenomenon in the last probably 12 months. We've recognised that the, the country's electricity demand is actually reducing. The amount of energy we're using you know, per square metre, per person, per process is actually reducing. And it's not just reducing a little bit, it's reducing quite significantly. So whether it be solar PV, which has had a measurable effect, whether it be energy efficiency, whether it be the commercial reality around energy costing more so we'll use less, that, that, um, that normal elasticity view, um, it's actually the demand's going down. The strange phenomenon, though, is that in response to the predictions of energy usage going through the roof four or five years ago, the electricity distribution industry in the last few years has spent billions of dollars on making their poles and wires bigger, if you like. And now we're all paying for that investment that they don't need. So some interesting phenomena around electricity prices. Sure, um, there's also a different ways to cut electricity prices. What you pay at home isn't what you or your employer will pay at work. There's some absolute cracker deals out there because it's a commercial market as such. There's a lot of energy efficiency kit installed in some pretty swoopy buildings around town that actually doesn't get used because they got a great electricity deal. And so why should they run it? Interesting things around all that. A lot of the modelling had carbon tax in it. Um, apparently we're getting rid of the carbon tax. What effect will that have? Um, gas is an interesting question in itself. Um, some of you may have read in the paper the escalation around gas prices, which I'll talk to in a moment. That has an effect on energy electricity prices around the country because we do use gas to generate electricity, not just good old brown coal as we do in Victoria. The drought had an interesting effect on electricity prices. That put a real spike in electricity prices because power stations require water to cool them. So the next drought will see the power of energy go up again. So all sorts of interesting things. So yes, electricity prices will continue to escalate. I think the graphs that show that that might not be the case I don't, must admit, I've never seen that ever really happen. Things do keep going up one way or the other. Um, but it's going to flatten out. It's certainly not, not going to be the rate we've seen in the last couple of years in terms of energy, uh, so electricity costs, which in some ways for the energy efficiency industry is not pro probably good news. Gas is a different story entirely. Um, we're in the process of building three or four major gas trains in Queensland to take gas out of the ground and put it in large ships and sell it overseas. Those gas trains are hooked back to the national, effectively what is a national gas grid. And so we're heading towards paying international parity price for gas. And that's driving the cost of gas absolutely skyward. And so that graph on the right hand side, um, there's predictions that, that we might see escalation in terms of gas prices somewhere north of 30% over the next three to four years. Now from a building's perspective, gas is not a major energy input, electricity is. But obviously some of our industries, whether it be food or manufacturing, heavily depends upon the gas and the price of gas. So again, that's why you're starting to see some real angst in the papers around what we've done in a policy sense around that gas pricing. In a building sense, um, you might have noticed that there's not a lot of noise around cogen and trigen systems anymore in buildings. It's really gone off the boil. In some ways, it's pretty much killed the whole idea of cogen and trigen in commercial buildings. The gas price um, has just made it not economically viable in many, many cases. There's still situations where it works, but it's really, um, really changed the nature of that, that commercial idea.
I mentioned a couple of times on the way through um, this concept of life cycles. It's, it's pretty fundamental to take it back down to a bit of a technical level. It's pretty fundamental to understand um, how to better manage HVAC, this concept of life cycles. HVAC systems haven't got a life cycle. Their components have life cycles. And, and these vary. And, and so it's no different to your car. Your tyres might last a couple of years, but the actual body of the car might last forever. And so what you find is that when you come to look at this, um, you need to work in that sort of concept of, of components with different life cycles. And obviously good maintenance um, is supportive of those life cycles. These numbers come out of uh, the Era Handbook and this is the sort of guidance that we as engineers use in, in terms of providing advice on these sorts of things. And it's determined by, I suppose, duty, it's determined by the level of maintenance and attendance, all those sorts of things, the quality of the plant you put in, a whole range of things, but these are general numbers. So, so things like air filters, drive belts, bearings, two, five years on average. Um, things like uh, motors, um, some of the, the tenancy fit out air distribution, things VAV boxes and what have you, and the controls, again, around the 10 years. Things like cooling towers, pumps, um, chillers, boilers, you know, 20 years if well maintained. But they're all different and we need to understand that uh, when we come to put a commercial framework around these things. So around these fundamental technical life cycles, you effectively have a management or even an opportunity cycle, if you like. And that's where we're heading next week. We're going to, to, to step through the cycle and look at what we've talked about today by way of the kit, uh, from a design perspective, installation perspective, management operation, maintenance, tuning, and then a retrofit opportunity perspective. From the perspective of owner or, 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 or building manager as such. So just in closing, uh, I'll firm up on that analogy around the car because it's always, I suppose, useful to actually pick up an analogy that actually is quite useful because it just, it just does change the way you think about things. And as I said at the outset, that's my objective today, to get you to think about HVAC a little bit differently. HVAC systems in buildings really are like cars. You think about your car ownership and your car ownership paradigm and how you think about your car. There is a level of amenity. And in that, there's some utility. Yes, it will get me to and from work reliably. I get a level of comfort. Those of you can remember when we used to buy cars that didn't have air conditioning, what a revelation that was. The thing is reliable. I don't have to worry about getting the phone call at two o'clock in the afternoon from my wife that tells me the car's broken down again and I can't get the kids from school. So you pay for that reliability as such. The thing is safe. No, I'm not gonna put my daughter into anything other than a five star NCAP car. And there's a standard as well. You know, there's people that uh, wanna drive a Mercedes and there's people who wanna drive her and I. And it's the same with air conditioning. A premium grade building will have a Mercedes air conditioning system and perhaps something in a different part of the market will have a Hyundai air conditioning system. Um, that's important when you come to perhaps put Hyundai chillers into a Mercedes air conditioning system. Maybe you shouldn't do things like that. Compliance. We register our car. It's got to be roadworthy. We've got some commercial compliance around our leases and things like that. Very similar to HVAC systems and the buildings that they live in. Obviously, similar sorts of costs. You've got inputs around energy, you've got inputs around maintenance and service, you've got issues around warranty, you've got costs around compliance. Um, you've got to manage all of that, certainly if you're looking at that as a tax claim for a you know, business vehicle and what have you. And obviously, you've got a bank or a finance company sitting over your shoulder, in a lot of cases, who really own the car and you've just got stewardship of the thing. And at the end of the day, you've also got this concept of life cycle, both technical and financial. You know, we all get to a stage with a car and you say, well, Jesus, it's about seven or eight years old. It's starting to cost me a bit much. Maybe I better start looking for another car and pass this on to somebody else. Um, you know, is it a technical or a financial life cycle issue? The two are interconnected. You need to plan for that. Well, I think I can't afford to do it this year. I'll do it next year. You need to manage that process. You've got to take a deep breath and go and talk to a dealer or a used car salesman or go on carsales.com or what have you. Um, and also, you've got to have some sense of measurements around that, whether it's anecdotal or by way of keeping some sort of record around, around how much you're spending and, and how, how the thing's going and such. So the analogy is quite good. So when you go down to the basement and have a bit of a walk around with your maintenance contractor, perhaps just have a think about the HVAC system and the components in a similar way that you might think about your own car. It's quite a powerful analogy.